If Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton hadn't invited them to tea, John and Sue would never have guessed that after she'd run away from the village fete, Aunt Sally had taken a job as Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's maid. And if they hadn't told Wurzel Gummidge, he wouldn't have been hiding in the shrubbery outside Bloomsbury Barton Hall, listening through the open French windows to what was going on inside. Uh, now, Sally, boomed Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, pulling on her mink coat, I'm going away for the weekend to Partington Hall, so you will be alone in the house. Do you think you could manage? Yes, madam, squeaked Aunt Sally. But don't imagine you can have the weekend off. There's plenty to occupy you. You can start by polishing all the furniture. And on her last words, she swept out of the room with her nose in the air to try on a dozen dresses for the weekend. An hour later, the scarecrow heard the Rolls-Royce purring away down the gravel drive, grubbed up a handful of flowers, shook the damp earth from the roots, and hurried round to make a formal entrance at the front door. Hello, Aunt Sally. Here, these are for you, he cried, thrusting the muddy bouquet into her arms. Aunt Sally lifted her painted nose into the air. Thank you. Ed put them in water. Are you an admirer? The scarecrow looked even more puzzled, not realising that Aunt Sally was now lost in a world of her own imagining. You remember me? As old Wurzel, Wurzel Gummidge. I come looking for you, Aunt Sally, to ask you to marry me. Oh, did you indeed? And who told you where to find me? A little bird told me, Aunt Sally, my little rubbing redbreast. He says he was working here. Working here? Working? I have never done a day's work in my life, I'll have you know. I happen to live here. All right. I thought the house belonged to the daft woman with the hat. The daft woman with the hat happens to be my companion. I happened to in 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 inherit the house, and now I'm the owner. And if you don't believe me, you can wipe your feet and come in and have some afternoon tea. All right. I could do with some of that. Aunt Sally led him into the house, creaking as she went. You can sit in the chair if you like, and put your feet on one of those tables. Wurzel Gummidge settled himself luxuriously into a fat armchair, lifted his stiff legs, and plonked his muddy boots on a shiny walnut table. Oh, I, this is the life and no mistake. What about my tea, then? Well, I shall have to prepare it myself. I have given the servants the day off. Would you excuse me, Mr. Gummidge? Oh, delighted, I'm sure replied the scarecrow, as Aunt Sally moved creakily towards the kitchen. Don't help me then, said Aunt Sally sarcastically, as she wheeled in the tea trolley a little later. Right here, Aunt Sally, sorry. Aunt Sally parked the trolley beside Wurzel Gummidge, sat jerkily down on a huge Chesterfield, and began to spread the plates about, balancing some of the arms of chairs and plonking others down onto the floor. There's Dundee cake, fruit cake, sponge cake with cream, sponge cake with chocolate, Battenberg cake, Swiss rolls, meringues, donuts, chocolate eclairs, cream horns, cream puffs, angel cakes, layer cakes, trifle jelly, ice cream gato, pork pies, sausage rolls, mince pies, watercress sandwiches, ham sandwiches, cucumber sandwiches, cheese sandwiches, tomato sandwiches, rock cakes, muffins, crumpets and pikelets. My, oh my. Oh, I, that's a tea and a half, that is. I haven't seen a tea like that since I don't know when. That's a tea as will go down in history, that is. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then no boiled eggs. I like boiled eggs, I does. Cake first, boiled eggs after, said Aunt Sally crossly. Where was you brought up? In a blooming field, I swear. <laughs> and you don't see cakes like that growing on hawthorn edges. Aunt Sally, pouring tea, recovered her best manner. <laughs> As you'd think, not indeed. Only the best people can afford them. Now, would you like six cakes or seven? I ain't got my counting there done. Which is the most? Six. That's what I love then. Thank you, can't you? Aunt Sally grabbed four cakes at random and slapped them down on Wurzel Gummidge's plate. There you are, six cakes. And then we'll start on the jelly. Well, how many jelly do I get? What a stupid question. You don't say how many jelly, you say how much jelly. You get half, same as what I do. Uh, it's the same as a quarter, but my quarter's bigger than yours because this happens to be my house. What about the trifle, then? The scarecrow mumbled, splattering cream around the room as he spoke. I could do with all that trifle to myself, so I could. We should see. And there's no need to slurp your tea. Only common people slurp, she said, making a noise like a bath emptying as she drank her own. What are you doing, then, if not slurping? I'm not slurping, I'm creaking. I happen to have rusty hinges. You'd have rusty hinges, too, if you had to sleep under a hedge. 
Ah, oh, poor old Aunt Sally. Is that where you ended up then, before you come into your impediment? I mean, into your impertinent, your impertinent, in, into your big house? I have known the depths of degradation, if you must know. Much you care. I could have been chopped up for firewood for all the trouble you took to find me. Oh, that's not true. I looked iron low, so I did, Aunt Sally. I searched the old parish top to bottom. I, I nearly found you once in an haystack. Only it weren't you. It were no beetroot stuck on a pitchfork. So I give up. I thought you'd gone to Egypt. He spooned jelly into his mouth from a huge cut glass bowl. Oh, I could have gone to Egypt or Romania. I've had many offers, you know, from princes and dukes and people. But I decided to stay and attend to my estates. After all, I do have Duchess's blood, you know. I come from a long line of ladies. I may have uh, had to sleep under hedges, but I have always been a lady. And take your thieving hands out of that there cake. Why, it's my chocolate cake, Aunt Sally. Now, looky here. I had one, two, and, and, and three cream cakes, and then I, then I had another one, and, and, and then another one. That there chocolate cake's mine. Then take it, then, she cried. See if I care. And she squashed the squishy cake onto the scarecrow's nose. All right, yeah. That's like that, is it? Well, now, to compare that game, and he poured a whole bowl of trifle over Aunt Sally's wooden head. My pretty face! You've spoiled my pretty face! You, oh, you horrible heap of straw! And she flung a jelly at him. Ah, do that to me, would he, you jelly-throwing clothes pig? I'll show he. Wurzel Gummidge took a sponge cake in each hand and clapped them to the sides of her head. Soon the room was in chaos as they bombarded one another with all the cakes and trifles and jellies they could find, screeching and shouting insults as they threw. Oh, you mouldy old sack of potatoes, you! Ah, you're just a skittle with an head on. That's all you are. Turnip face, firewood, haystack, broom handle, scarecrow, coconut shy. And they raced towards one another, slamming blamage into each other's faces. Soon the drawing room of Bloomsbury Barton Hall was in chaos. But in the middle of it, Wurzel Gummidge and Aunt Sally were at peace. Cakes and trifles and jellies had flown everywhere, spattering the furniture with cream. There was chocolate dribbling down the walls, and the odd sandwich and eclair had lodged in corners and on the tops of pictures. Shall I tell you something, Aunt Sally? That were a very fine tease just I had, but, you know, I still feel a bit hungry, seeing as how most of it didn't go down my stomach. Aunt Sally creaked to her feet. Oh, that's easily remedied. I've got lots of food in case important people come to dinner. I give them boiled eggs, usually. Oh, I... He said I could have a few boiled eggs after I've eaten my cake. Well, I'd see if I know how to make them. I usually leave it to the cook. And with a little curtsy, she was gone, leaving Wurzel Gummidge stretched out in his chair, well pleased with his afternoon. Hello, said Mr. Peters, driving the children back from shopping towards Scatterbrook. Here's trouble. For ahead of them in the road, they could see Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's yellow Rolls Royce, and beside it the fat figure of Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton herself frantically waving at them. He stopped the car and wandered over to her. Oh, Mr. Peters, I'm so glad that you came along. I know how you enjoy tinkering with electrical things. I'm sure you'll get us moving in no time. Mr. Peters and Humphrey, the chauffeur, examined the engine and shook their heads. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. I reckon you're going to need a new gearbox. Gearbox? But I am expected a Partington Hall. Mr. Peters looked at his battered old car and grinned. Oh, well... Not to worry, I, I can give you a lift. In that, one would rather arrive in the dust cart. No, you must drive me back to Bloomsbury Barton Hall at once. I'll telephone for a hire car from there. The suitcases, Humphreys. And she strode towards Mr. Peter's little car. Back at the hall, Aunt Sally was staggering into the drawing room, weighed down by two vast earthenware bowls full of eggs. Here we are, she panted, waking the scarecrow from his doze. Twenty-four boiled eggs, each. And a loaf of bread cut into egg soldiers. What are you doing? She said suspiciously as he went down on one knee and clutched his hat to his chest. Well, I I'm not going to ask you to marry me, Aunt Sally. Don't be ridiculous, Mr. Gummidge, she exclaimed, putting on her most pompous voice. And arise at once in that semi recumbent posture. Besides, your boiled eggs will get cold. I don't matter. Don't matter if I starve from hunger. Be danged if I'll eat a boiled egg before I do what I come here to do. Aunt Sally, I worship the ground that you walk on, 
and I ask you humbly for your hand in marriage. But you're only a silly old scarecrow. I am a genuine Aunt Sally. I've been exhibited to the best fowls in the country. I've had balls thrown at me by the landed gentry in person. Oh, I'm very sorry, but I could only marry a gentleman. Wurzel Gummidge looked indignant. I could be a gentleman, Aunt Sally. Get a top hat so I couldn't and live with you in this big house. You? Well, I doubt if you could even eat a boiled egg like a gentleman. I can eat a boiled egg like the highest born gentleman has ever lived. Oh, very well. If you can eat a boiled egg like a gentleman, I will consider. I say, consider your proposal of marriage. Oh, all right. Well, now you watch. I'm watching. He looked down at the bowl of eggs in front of him. Ah, yeah, well, you hold your horses then. I, I, I've, I've got to work this out. He gingerly picked up a knife and fork, stuck out his elbows high and wide, and hovered over his bowl of eggs. With a snooty sneer, Aunt Sally plonked an egg cup in front of him, and using his knife and fork like chopsticks, Wurzel Gummidge gingerly managed to transfer an egg into it. Taking a deep breath, he plunged his knife and fork into the egg, and a bright stream of yolk squirted up and hit him straight in the eye. Oi! he shouted. That ain't fair! This ain't a bald egg at all. It is raw, so it is. Oh, dear me. I'm terribly sorry. But I couldn't get the eggs into the kettle. You haven't poor old Wurzel on, as what you've been doing, telling me to eat bald eggs like a gentleman when they ain't bald at all. It ain't fair. You're a wicked, artless piece of furniture. What did you call me, may I beg leave to ask? A piece of furniture, he bellowed, grabbing an egg from his bowl and hurling it at her. A witch's broom, a stick with an horse's head handle, a mouldy old coconut shy. Hey. But he never managed to finish the last insult, because Aunt Sally had picked up her own bowl of eggs and caught him squarely on the nose with her first shot. In seconds, the room was even more of a shambles than it had been before, with eggs flying everywhere, smashing and dribbling down the walls and furniture. And in the fury of the fight, neither of them heard the sound of Mr. Peter's old car pulling up outside. Hey, you are, then. Uh, deliberate Edora speciality. Uh, pity about your nice Rolls Royce, grinned Mr. Peters. Well, if you'd like to come inside for a moment, Mr. Peters, the hire car may not be available, in which case I'll have to ask you to drive me to Partington Hall after all. <laughs> inside the hall, the drawing room was a complete shambles. The furniture was overturned, Pictures had been knocked off the walls and ornaments off shelves, and everywhere there was a litter of sandwiches and cakes and cream and broken eggs. It's not the slightest use you're sitting there sulking, Wurzel Gummidge, said Aunt Sally, staggering into the room under the weight of two buckets of water and a mop. You've had your fun, now you can help me clear up. Shan't. Them as made the mess can clear it up. Well, you made as much mess as I did, I'd like you to know. Ah, but you started it. You started it, so you did. You threw the first cake, and the first jelly, and the first egg. You threw the first egg, but I shall throw the first bucket of water. And she promptly poured the whole of one of the buckets over his head. Right, he bellowed. That there does it. Fun and games is fun and games, but getting my straw wet is differ. Come hold of this. And he flung the other bucket of water right back at her. My paint! Oh, my pretty paint! If you've ruined my pretty paint, I'll set you on fire! There was a noise from the hall, and for a moment they froze. Oh, that good-for-nothing housemaid, said Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, who'd heard the noise they'd been making. The moment my back is turned, she's watching the television. Sitting in there with her feet up, I shouldn't wonder, she cried, throwing open the door. She took one look at her devastated room, screamed, and fainted dead away into Mr. Peter's arms. Aunt Sally? gave a little curtsy, and Wurzel Gummidge, still with a bucket on his head, made for the French windows, galloped away as fast as his legs would carry him, and didn't stop until he reached Ten Acre Field. <laughs>